where you can hear constantly Kuna playing. So that's a Kuna playing, you know, not, not what type of playing, it was a Kuna playing. Here he is taking his uh, tripacer, Piper tripacer, right in. He is chairman of the new Shannon Flying Services. Well, congratulations. That was a fine three-point landing you made there. Ah, well, it's, it's, it's very good, you know. Very nice and great uh, pleasure. It gives you great pleasure. How old were you when you took up flying? Oh, 61. That was after you retired from business? After, after I retired from business, yes. Now, I had nothing to do with you, see? Yes. Well, at your age, we think of men retiring to the bath chair, or certainly leading well, a quiet life. that's wrong. If they get active and keep active and come and learn to fly, they'd all be alive today. They'd wonder what to do with them all in the world. But isn't flying a young man's sport? No, there's some old fellows at it too. Here's one of them today. <laughs> and there goes Ireland's flying octogenarian. And many happy landings to him. Uh, Limerick Flying Club's roots uh, lie actually in the history of the airfield. Um, there was a gentleman called Arthur Toppen, uh, who was a local businessman, and uh, he bought this as a farm in the 1940s and the company that was here then was Shannon Flying Services. So I learned to fly with Shannon Flying Services and I went solo and I got my license with them. Uh, then Shannon Flying Services, they became Air Ireland and the chief flying instructor was here went off to fly with Air Ireland. They left there and, if you like, abandoned us in that sense that there was no flying anymore. So that really bothered us. So myself, uh, Brendan Began, and a friend called Brian Carpenter, unfortunately, was passed away. We were all flying at the time. So we decided to start again, if you like, if that's the right word, and we formed uh, the Limerick Flying Club. So we had no aircraft here. We had wanted aircraft for a while and we used to fly that. So we approached the Munster Fly Club in Cork and they agreed to send us an aircraft here at the, about two days a week. And if the interest was strong enough, they would maybe increase that. So we decided to buy an aircraft and we had no money, but three of us decided to buy an aircraft and we approached Iona Airways up in Dublin, Pierce Cattle. We bought uh, the first club aircraft off him uh, Echo India, Alpha, Oscar, Oscar. And that came into Kuna in 1970. I had the dubious honour of, of paying two pounds for the very, very, very first membership card uh, of, of the Limerick Flying Club. So we were the, the initial founders of the club and we've been members of the club ever since. We bought what we called a rally aircraft or a French aircraft and we bought one or two of those. Eventually we ended up flying rallies for, for 30 years. There are two seats side by side and you could, you could nearly land them vertically, you know, you could nearly drop them onto the ground and they'd still survive. And eventually uh, we had to move them on because they were getting old, parts were getting hard to get, it's very expensive. It was decided to buy what we have now, they're called Technons. They're Italian and uh, one, two of the guys went over and flew it all the way back here. And subsequently now we have three of them. And uh, if I say so myself, they're fabulous aircraft. And they're much, much more uh, fuel efficient and engine efficient than the ones we had. So hanging on to your old aircraft might sound a good idea because it's cheap, but it isn't cheap at the end of the day. Uh, very popular training aircraft uh, and growing in popularity, though we are the only club in Ireland operating them. Then the other 10 aircraft, the other seven aircraft here are owned by groups of members, you know, two, three, four members club together and uh, buy an airplane. Our own 
front is the one Brendan spoke about them having flown from Italy on it in 2007. Then the other one was brought in in 2008, and we bought that from Waterford in 2019. There's one plane at the back of the hangar. Um, it's known as an Aronka. Um, it can even be a Delta Delta Delta. And Joe Sullivan is one of the owners of that. That airplane is one year older than this one. So there's lots of history here. The runway is uh, is brilliant in that it's karma. So many airplanes in private aviation are grass. And that means so many of them get wet, get buggy. You have to be very, very careful. Some of them are very well maintained, some of them are appalling. The shortest paved or hard surface runway in Ireland here in Kula. 2416 metres long and 9 metres wide. It was actually when I started here, it was only 350 metres, but we extended it and it's quite narrow and it tends to put some flyers off because they're operating let's say from a long field wide field but we're so used to it that our biggest problem is when we fly down to the shannon or somewhere cork or something we don't know what to do with ourselves when we see this vast concrete runway you know my god where to put this thing down kind of thing if you can land here you can land anywhere <laughs> My interest in aviation was uh, brought along by my dad and my grandfather who used to regularly take me to Shannon on a Sunday afternoon and uh, my uncle, that's my dad's brother, was in the Royal Air Force. He was a navigator with uh, their coastal command based in Ballykelly in Northern Ireland and so we used to holiday up there and we used to be taken out to the air base. So airplanes have been in my life since almost day one and fascination. Uh, building model aircraft and watching aircraft fly over and I used to uh, go to Shannon to watch the aircraft. My first flight was actually here in April of 71 with a guy who was the chief flying instructor at the time called Hayden Lawford and it was a trip my dad organised for myself and my brother um, that April and 15 minute flight in a tailwheel airplane here and I came down and I was absolutely buzzing and I broke my parents' hearts on the, when, till my 17th birthday, the, the following Christmas, and it was my first flying lesson, and my membership was my birthday present for my 17th birthday. I was interested in um, aircraft. I used to go to Shannon, and then I found out there was a company operating here. I came along here to Kuna, and I started flying uh, in 1967. I think it was three pounds an hour, uh, at three pounds, 10 shillings an hour to fly. So I used to come out and do a half an hour. So that was one pound, whatever it was. My father, my late father, worked in Shannon on the ground with the airlines. So he, I was out there from the age of about four. So soon I'd be watching these all the time. So eventually came out here, uh, tried to summon up the courage of coming in. And that was in the days of the Shannon Flying Services. And I came in and took my first lesson there. I think it was about 17, 18. It's fantastic for the student and it's fantastic for the instructor if you've brought someone from walking in the gate to send them off solo. But it is actually nerve wracking just to make sure that they get back on the ground because I always say the students have one ambition in life and that's to kill the instructor. You know? You're told that if it's not right, you overshoot and you do it again. You don't want to do that because you feel you're making an ass of yourself, but it's actually the right thing to do. The solo flight was terrifying, but you get used to it after that. It's, it's everybody learning to fly, the guys that are flying the big jets and so on, they are, everybody talks about that day. But you never forget it, you never forget it. It's always there. Elation would be the, the word, absolute elation. Euphoric comes. It is a huge experience. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, I, it's only later when I was instructing that it's a big responsibility on the instructor too to have confidence in someone. When any time you send someone solo for the first time, you're kind of, you're outside and you're walking up and down. If I smoked, I'd be smoking. There was a big occasion whenever that happened, you know, because the student always come along. If they knew they were going to go solo, they'd come along in an old shirt or an old tie. Back in those days, we all wore ties. <laughs> a lot of the lads today wouldn't even know what a tie is unless they were going to a wedding or sadly a funeral. It was later on when we formed the club that we introduced the, um, the shirt or we 
I think it was bras as well they collected, you know, so it was uh, ties, uh, collar of a shirt or whatever they could get. They say that they came out of from the military and the uh, kind of the loose uh, thing was that uh, you were cutting the ties of, you know, from the, in, your instructor in other words, you were like branching out like away from home, you're leaving the parents and you're leaving the, 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 the guy or whoever and um, you were now heading out on your own. So I believe that's where it came from. I still happen to have my part of the tie and it was, I was wearing this after college and it just got removed with a pen knife and the other half hung here for years and somebody threw them all out unfortunately there, there were dozens of them hanging up there and, but that was part of the ritual off the runway out there heading towards the city I've uh, been at college in Mulberry Street studying my accountancy exams and I came out to do a bit of flying with the instructor and um, after about 35 40 minutes he said you're ready Harry go have fun he got out of the airplane and I was on my own so away I went and uh, did one circuit and came back in and great and it was a great buzz you know I didn't expect it on the day wind was favoring coming that way so I was landing this side which is a bit trickier than the other side and uh, it was a Sunday morning and there was quite a few watches uh, I you, you get up, you're flying downwind as we call it, and you give a big yell out here, I did, and that you were free of the instructor, and then suddenly you're committing to land, and uh, oh, you've got everything right. We came in and landed, and landed and taxied back down, and I was sitting there, and as I say, it's one behind the other, so you can't see. Next I noticed the door was opening, and I kind of looked, and I saw Hayden, and he was standing outside. He just he said, do one and do another if you're happy. He closed the door. And I kind of looked and I said, hmm. So I just put on power and took off. And I think about 10 feet off the ground, I thought, you have to land this thing now as well, you know. So um, I did, and uh, it was fantastic, you know, to be up there by yourself and to realize that you actually had to, you had control of this and you were responsible for it. And so I flew around and came in and landed and did another one. and continued on since then you know so. I do remember a friend who's still around flying he's an examiner now brought me to a certain pub not far from here and I was very very drunk when I got home very drunk on brandy so I was glad <laughs> when did my first solo I got my driving license the same week <laughs> we were here in Kuna um, Fonzie at the time was actually working here in Kuna he was doing for Shannon flying services and I was I used to come out here and I used to fly solo and Fonzie would be, there was a little office out there and Fonzie would be there. And uh, neither of us had a license at the time, and uh, but there was no one else on the field. So um, we decided it's, you can't actually, you can only bring a passenger up if you have um, a license. So both of us student licenses, we hadn't got a full license, but you, you can't fly with one another. So we went up flying around. So the two of us were in the aircraft, it's not strictly legal, but, uh, we came back, we had done a couple of circuits and we came back to land and um, we saw the Colonel Toppen. Colonel Toppen was an old British uh, Colonel and he owned the field. And we saw his car was parked out there. So we knew he'd kill us if uh, we landed. So what we, I landed here and taxied back down to the end of the runway. And I opened the door and Fonzie slid out into the grass. And I took off and landed again and came back in and uh, taxied in and Toppen looked at me and he said, he saw Fonzie walking up the runway and he said, were you flying? I said, no, I was flying, but Fonzie was just watching me, you know, so uh, we got away with that one in Kuna that day. Each year we try to organise a fly out where we get maybe seven to ten aircraft and we fly to different airfields around the country. We try to do it uh, kind of going on a, a Saturday and staying overnight and coming back on a Sunday. Uh, an airfield will host an event and they'll sort of say that that's the kettle is on uh, come and visit us for the day just the general banter coming in having a cup of coffee to tea and it's been great for the club you know what, the way we organize it is with the club aircraft we try to get one instructor to go with a student so it'll be a, a, a good experience for the student to do uh, cross-country navigation 
So the instructor goes along and lets them do all the navigation. An awful lot of them now are informal, where just fellow aviators come with their airplanes, they exchange stories, um, you know, hangar tales as we call them, and um, look at each other's airplanes and take photographs and have a cup of coffee or a bottle of water or whatever because they won't find they can't drink. We used to organise barbecues and we'd have a bar and people would stay over, you know. A lot of them would sleep in the hangar or in the huts or whatever, you know. So they're, they're very good, they're very social occasions. And you get, you know, it gets people from all around the country into your own airfield. Not every year, but over the years we've had, in the latter years we've had, uh, started to have fly-ins as we call them. And they're very big around the country. One of the biggest ones we ever held was here in 1984. And we had 60, 70 airplanes here and we had special control tower built and big aerobatic display. And we had uh, erected you know, one of these tall um, what do you call it? stages or, or whatever the phrase is and uh, I was stuck up there I think um, commentating and it was a, a very very hot day and by god I got sunburned after this. <laughs> we set up tables in the hangar and we had caterers in and we had quite a lot of people from all around the country you know, and from England and foreign parts and we had I think there was about two or three hundred people attended this. We've attracted quite a lot of young people. For, for a number of years there, back in the um, 80s, uh, we went downhill a bit, you know, we, you know, we didn't have that many mem members. But in the you know, 90s and into the 10s, it started to pick up. And with COVID, I don't know what's happened, there's been a huge you know, upsurge of interest. There's 100 members approximately in the flight club at the moment, 50 of whom are students and the other half, well, probably 35, 40 of them would be active uh, license holders. And then there'd be a few life members who are no longer flying or who are still members, but not active flying members. We have one young student here who's not even 17 yet, and he started last July. And he's targeted to have his license by the summer because he wants to go flying commercially when he does his leaving cert in September. So he did his first solo flight here about three, four weeks ago. Is one of the youngest that we've had in a long, long time. The people that will stay with it and want to stay with it, you know, it's the it's the passion, it's the drug bit. And in my own case, like I uh, had to go away from it for some years because you got married or you bought a house and a mortgage and children and education, and there was time I just couldn't afford it. I had to stop, but I knew I wasn't going to stop. I was going to come back, but I had to wait till I got the money back. It's a unique hobby. I'll admit it's not a cheap hobby, um, but in terms of affordability, if you're interested enough, you can make it. So, I mean, it costs about between ten and eleven thousand to do your pilot's license at the moment. Spread that over two years. It's and if you're fortunate, you've got a reasonably good job and you're working away and save. Yeah, I didn't drink when I was starting flying, so all my money went into flying. Lots of people have interest in flying. You know that. It's, it's kind of an exotic thing, you think, you know, flying, you know, you go in a, a big jet and you think that's fantastic. It's c completely different than a light aircraft. You feel every little movement of the aircraft, you're watching the countryside go by. Dizzies. 
addiction, whatever. It, I can't explain it properly. So it's just got into the blood as a kid, and uh, all I ever wanted to do was that. If it's in your blood, you'll fly it. It's not you. Whatever they, they might, image might be of flying, I don't know what it is I'd like out there, but if they think it's some sort of an elite sport, I mean, you have everybody here from every possible walk of life with no money at all, so many, so many to, to obviously well off people and in between. The door is always open as long as you're reasonably healthy and it's a good way to stay healthy because you've got to do medicals every five years when you're younger and then when you get to my age, you have to do it every year and keep you on your game. If you start flying, you never give up. The only the only reason you give up flying is if your health comes at you. I, I again, there's two people getting presented on Saturday for 50 years flying. We have other people, you know, the 35, the 40 years. So there's a huge, as I say, a huge uh, fellowship in flying. And what I like also is anyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. I'm retired, so come a good day like this. And if there's nothing else on and there's no grandchildren hanging out of me. I'm coming out here and go somewhere. I like to go places. With the career I had in accountancy and practice, and there were times in the, the last 20 years things got very stressful with the economy and all the rest. I used to come out here and just get in the plane and walk for half an hour to an hour. And you learn to leave absolutely everything on the ground when you get into an airplane. You do not bring stress and trouble with you. Fantastic sense of freedom. Fabulous. Yeah. Once you get up there, Whatever it bad is on your mind, you're fighting with the wife, or you're worrying about something, or you're, everything goes. I can't explain that properly to you. It, and you might only be up for half an hour, which is not long, but it's all gone. I think it's it's in my blood. Um, it's it. I think from the time I was nine or ten, I always wanted to fly. I, I you know, as I say, I used to watch aircraft. I used to build aircraft. It just gives me a buzz. Um, like I said, a light aircraft in aviation for 50, 60 years and while some people like to go playing golf and others like to go to the horses, I like aircraft. Up, up and away. <laughs>